Welcome to the National Press Foundation. I'm Sunny Efren, NPF's president, and we're coming to you from the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios in Washington, DC. Today, we're talking about the battle over waivers for international intellectual property rights to COVID-19 vaccines, but more broadly, the argument over whether IP protections are a barrier to many other life-saving medicines reaching people in the developing world or a boon to innovation. That argument is playing out at the World Trade Organization, inside the White House and beyond. And of course, it's complicated. So first, I'd like to thank our sponsor, the Heinrich Foundation, for underwriting a series of trainings for journalists on international trade issues. You can see all of our previous content, and that link will be in the chat. One more announcement. Applications are now open for a virtual global fellowship in covering rare diseases, open to reporters all over the world. Reporting grants of up to $3,000 will be given out for accepted fellows to travel to cover rare disease projects of your choice. And that application will also be in the chat. So please do share it with your newsroom colleagues, particularly um, business, but also uh, medical reporters. And now I'm very delighted to welcome um, Jennifer Brandt, CEO and founder of In Innovation Insights, coming to us from Geneva, and Andrea Shalal, senior correspondent with Reuters in Washington, who's been covering this issue. And soon we will have Dr. Ruth Okadeji, the Jeremiah Smith Professor at Harvard Law School, joining us from Boston. So thank you so much for um, making time to help journalists unpack this complicated issue. As always at MPF, we are on the record. Journalists, you do not have to take notes because this program is being recorded and we will post a transcript at nationalpress.org uh, probably tomorrow. Um, there will be plenty of time for Q&A, but you are always welcome to ask questions at any time. Please just drop your question in the chat or you can raise your Zoom hand and Jeff will unmute you. And with that, um, let me turn this over to you. Um, Dr. Okadeji, welcome. Um, you've written that less than 2% of the total number of COVID vaccine doses that have been given have been given in Africa, but at least 60% of African populations will need to be vaccinated to mitigate the spread of the virus. And, and that's not going to happen in 2023. So can you start us off with what happened at the WTO last week and what happens now? Well, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that this problem is not new. It's been um, a feature of the international trade system, the international intellectual property system, really um, since the onset of <clears throat> the idea of a patent that would protect innovation and um, create an incentive to create these medicines to save lives in the first place. And given that you have robust exclusive rights uh, granted by a patent, the implication is both that the monopoly pricing effect that a patent uh, confers and the um, amount of, of um, both actors and policies and regulations that are necessary to facilitate the transfer of technology, is particularly uh, drug development technologies, um, is fairly significant, covered not just by patent laws, but by multiple forms of IP. So when you think about the effects of those, we've created a global system in which um, one patent and other related intellectual property rights um, create a thicket um, around access to, to medicines. And then, of course, there are um, non-patent related challenges that also create these barriers. But I think for our uh, purposes today, we are focusing on, um, on the patent related uh, challenges. So this is a problem that, that um, I've been studying since I was in law school um, um, in the 1990s. And at, at the time, it was simply the fact that a patent taken out in India, for example, meant that um, average Indians were paying more than Americans uh, for the same drug. Um, and of course, uh, there was no competition, uh, no generics. That sort of challenge to global health, challenge to economic development, challenge to just valuing life motivated India and other governments to begin looking at the patent system. And of course, India um, today is, is often described as, a, as the world's generic supplier. Uh, so th there's a long history 
behind this problem. And I think for journalists, it's important to situate the current access to COVID-19 vaccines in the context of that long history. Um, and the real question is whether we will be prepared for the next pandemic. Scientists seem clear that we are going to have another public health crisis. We've, we've had several alone in the last decade. And although we were the unfortunate witnesses of many, many lives being lost through the HIV AIDS pandemic, um, this problem didn't get resolved. In, in, in many ways, it, we made some gains. There was the Doha Declaration that made clear that governments could um, address public health crises um, and not allow patents to be a barrier. Uh, there were, of course, grants and donations, um, many institutions that were established um, during the HIV AIDS pandemic, um, but none of those actually came to um, have much of an effect when COVID-19 hit the scene. And so this question of what the WTO is negotiating um, it, with respect to a waiver is an effort, of course, uh, most of you will know that South Africa and India first made this proposal. Um, a lot of outrage, the Biden administration um, um, then signed on to it, but there was there was and still is resistance um, from uh, Germany and other European countries uh, to the idea of, of IP waivers. The question is, can we have a mechanism that is effective in reducing the transaction costs that will allow generic manufacturers to very quickly begin producing medicines when we hit an emergency situation as we did with COVID-19, or when there is simply not, not necessarily a global pandemic, but just a public health crisis that, re that requires access to medicines. That is what is on the table. Um, the, uh, the recent uh, amendments at the WTO, uh, as recent as up to a week ago, don't go as far as advocates want. Um, they go further than innovators and patent owners want. Um, um, we, we, we tell our students in law schools that uh, a settlement in which no one is happy is typically a good settlement. Um, the challenge here is, is, are we saving the lives that can be saved? That's the real question. Are we saving the lives that can be saved? And I've written that waivers alone are, are insufficient, but they signal, in my view, a change and a recognition that we have to do something to save lives and to prevent lives from being needlessly lost because the price of drugs um, is simply unaffordable to most of the world's population. Um, or because no one is actually innovating in, say, communicable diseases, a, a space in which many, many lives are being lost daily. Um, and so the, the, the current proposal is meant to eradicate some of the barriers, intellectual property bar patent barriers, in particular intellectual property barriers, um, so the generics can more quickly get to the market. Um, as, and we may get back to this later, but as I've said, you know, there are lots of other pieces that need to go um, into effect in order for the waiver itself to have much meaning. So let's stop, pause for a sec and um, let's move on to you, Jen. You are the author of a new report on innovation and kind of on the opposite side um, of this argument. So can you tell us, um, give us a, a flavor of what, what the implication of WTO decision is in your, if any, in, in your view, and also um, where, where are the advocates getting this wrong? Okay, so I wanted to first agree that this is a solution that nobody seems to want. So. <laughs> That's um, something we can agree right away on. Um, it doesn't go far enough for the advocates and for India and South Africa, and certainly for some of the developed countries and in industry. They felt it went too far. Um, and this is not really a waiver. That's the other thing to note. It's not whole, wholly setting aside IP protections for the products covered by it. It's more um, an agreement to facilitate the use of provisions already in the WTO agreements whereby you can set aside patents in emergency situations. Um, so that's one thing I wanted to say. Um, I am coming at this from a slightly different angle. In the fall of last year, I completed some research on IP and COVID, and I'll circle back to the implications of this research for, in terms of how I, I the TRIPS waiver. Um, we looked at, during the first 18 months of the pandemic, how intellectual property worked in relation to development of the leading vaccine candidates and then also certain therapeutics. And there we had um, the fortune to 
have a look under the hood and interview some of the executives at the companies that led that effort. And it was really interesting. Um, we looked at three stages of innovation in response to the pandemic. We looked first at the contribution of intellectual property to the development of the background technologies and knowledge. So what was available when the pandemic started to draw on in order to develop solutions? We also looked at the second, what we called the second phase or act two, which were the partnerships, the collaboration, all of the efforts that went into developing these vaccines, securing regulatory approval and figuring out how to make them and get them to people. And act three for us, the third phase was how these global manufacturing networks were set up um, quite rapidly and integrating a number of new players. And there I note that we were looking at the number of global partnerships for manufacturing when we cut off our research in August, 2021. And we found about 45 publicly announced partnerships. And today there's more than 350. And there was a very interesting article uh, last summer by the Wall Street Journal looking at somebody from Pfizer who was scouring the globe for manufacturing partners during the pandemic to make sure that they could rapidly scale up how much they were able to produce. And that, that process of integrating people into these global manufacturing networks involves a lot of tech transfer, a lot of knowledge sharing. And a lot of that is supported actually by intellectual property protection. And our research in fact showed a significant amount of collaboration, um, even competitors working together right away when the pandemic hit in order to develop um, the new vaccines for COVID so rapidly. And what intellectual property allowed, um, both patents and trade secrets, is the, the sharing of knowledge and technology without losing control over it. And this was especially important for smaller companies like BioNTech, for example. The fruit of 25 years of research was their mRNA platform. And they were able to continue collaborating with Pfizer to pivot from using that platform to develop flu vaccines to COVID vaccines and still not lose control over this technology that they had invested so much time and energy developing over so many years. Um, our research also uncovered some really amusing stories, which if we have time, we can get into. But you know, from the silly, from things like when they figured out how to make the mRNA vaccine at scale, they realized that a ticket wouldn't stick to the, the vaccine vial in the ultra cold storage. So they had to go back and innovate the sticker for the vial. Um, to other things that were really interesting and surprising to us, things like you know, putting substantial human resources and financial resources on the COVID challenge and pulling that away from other disease categories. So we were surprised to find, um, to just see the amount of, of redirecting of resources and attention by some of these, these companies. And then of course, governments played a really important role. We, ha we have to also acknowledge that. So pulling back for a second, if I may, um, I think it's important for journalists to understand that there are a number of actors in health innovation and a number of actors will typically intervene from the lab from the upstream you know, general research where you understand the disease pathway in the body. That might be a university, a research center, an academic, all the way through that product that is developed based on that upstream research hitting the market. And along the way, the technology or the learning, the trade secrets, et cetera, the patents are handed off from one partner to the other as it moves closer to the market. And that handoff process is supported also, again, by intellectual property rights which allow the sharing of these, this information. There's also, I would say one other thing I'd like to point out, a, kind of a new versus old vision of how innovation happens. Um, the old way of doing things was putting a bunch of smart people in the room. There's a vertical integration of how you do R&D, you develop manufacturing, you make everything in house, et cetera. Today, we see globally distributed R&D networks. We see globally distributed manufacturing networks, things happening with many partners across borders. Um, some of that's also related to product complexity. If you look at a car, for example, it's a computer on wheels. Like no one entity in this age of increasing, increasingly complex products can bring everything to the table needed to develop those. And again, this intellectual property can help those partners work together. And I repeat, that's important, especially for smaller companies that may have a great solution, but they don't know how to do clinical trials. They don't know how to manufacture. So they're able to work with other partners and not lose control over what they bring to the table using IP. So going back to the TRIPS waiver um, and how I would interpret that based on the research that I conducted last fall, um, we heard from all of the executives that we interviewed, and we interviewed more than 12, uh, that 
all of the companies immediately had a sense of wanting to contribute, wanting to work with others, wanting to solve this problem. And they pretty quickly put all of their know-how and relevant technologies on the table. Um, you know, NDAs were agreed quickly on the back of a napkin, that kind of thing. And we asked this question, we said, what if there was no IP protection for what you had put on the table or what you had to contribute? And most of them said that they would still come forward and contribute. They would still act to address that health crisis, but they would probably share less with others. So if you take the example of, you know, one of the vaccine manufacturers that we spoke with, they said, once we had our vaccine developed and regulatory approval had been secured, we realized we could only using our in-house facilities make 500,000 doses. So clearly that wasn't gonna cut it. So in a, in a world where the IP protection for that vaccine candidate and the different components of it is not available, they may be reluctant to go, to go work with others. And that's, I'll stop there. That's what we heard from the people we interviewed. Okay, before we go on to Andrea for the news piece, um, if anyone has questions, this is a good time to raise your hand and we will take them. Um, so feel, feel free to, to do that. And then I just wanna go back on one, one technical um, issue, Jen, if you would clarify for us um, the difference between a patent and a trade secret and how that plays into this question of sharing and internet um, intellectual property protection. Because I think journalists uh, mm -hmm. mute, merge those two things in our heads. Sure. And I think IP, I mean, Professor Okadiji is probably very familiar with how scary and complicated IP seems to people. Um, so a patent is a registered right. You apply for it country by country where you're going to you know, manufacture or R do R&D or sell your product. Um, it covers industrial property, like an in, in, in innovation, like a machine, that kind of thing. Uh, it's time limited. You get a exclusive right for usually 20 years, um, give or take. And you often will use a patent in conjunction with a trade secret. So for in a trade secret, in contrast, is an unregistered right. It exists by virtue of you having kept it secret. It has commercial value and you have usually processes in place in your company, your organization to keep that secret, not let it get out. Because once it gets out, it's unprotected any of your competitors can use it. Whereas if one of your competitors tries to use your patented invention, you can go to court against them, right? Or you can take other action to stop that. Um, trade secrets are licensed and shared as our patents. And trade secrets played a very important role actually in the collaboration that led to the development of COVID vaccines and especially to bringing the manufacturing partners up to speed to make sure they could make things of the right quality um, and efficiently using safe processes, et cetera. Okay. A little bit um, and maybe offer some clarification um, uh, or complementary um, um, dimensions to Jennifer's um, description. So one of the things I think is important for journalists to note that the three major categories of intellectual property are patents, copyrights, trademarks, um, and then trade secrets. In the United States, um, there is a singular constitutional source for patents and copyrights, and that's Article One, Section 8, Clause 8 of the Constitution that empowers Congress to pass laws um, rewarding artists and inventors. Trademarks and trade secrets actually are what we would describe as um, common law forms of protection for um, creative outputs that do not meet the criteria for, for patentability or for copyrightability. Now that said, there are innovators who choose to keep their innovations as a trade secret. So the famous example is Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola could have patented its Coke formula, it chose not to. The reason, and this is where I think journalists um, are, are so helpful in, in educating the public, the reason innovators think about which body of intellectual property, which category of intellectual property am I going to utilize um, in the marketplace, from a public policy perspective, there is a trade-off. Um, we give patents, um, what Jennifer referred to as an exclusive right, actually a patent doesn't give you a right to do anything other than, than exclude. Um, there isn't a positive right that, that the statute gives you, but um, 
we induce disclosure of the innovation in the patent document. So the idea is when you disclose your innovation as an incentive to that disclosure, um, we give you an exclusive regime where you can prevent others from making, from using, from selling, from offering to sell, from importing that product. So patents, like copyrights, like other forms of intellectual property, are territorial. So you get a US patent, you get a German patent, you get a South African patent, you get an Indian patent. There is no such thing as a single patent um, that covers the globe. And in each country, you have to satisfy the criteria for patentability. What the TRIPS agreement did was it, it established a minimum set of standards that every country's national laws must have in order to issue a patent nationally. Now, you can raise the standard, but you can't go beneath it. Um, and so, for example, India, with its generic um, uh, industry, has heightened one of the patentability standards so that it's not so easy for you to simply issue or make minor amendments or adjustments, say, to a drug molecule and then get a, a patent on it. So one of the, we refer to this as evergreening, right? This, you make minor improvements, it's the exact same innovation, and then you get a patent for another 20 years. And so countries like India, uh, South Africa a little bit, um, have decided in their patent laws to heighten the standards for patentability to make it more difficult to do things like evergreening. Uh, the US uh, takes a different approach and countries around the world take a different approach. But in theory, there is a global minimum set of standards that every country has to have um, in order to issue before a patent is issued. So that's something I think it's important for journalists to understand. There is no global patent. You go from country to country. Uh, the second thing that I think is important that Prior to the TRIPS agreement, many developing countries, South Africa, India, did not extend patent protection to pharmaceuticals. And frankly, this is also true for many OECD countries. Patent protection for pharmaceuticals is actually a very recent vintage. In 1883, when the Paris Convention for Industrial Property was negotiated, um, there was not a country in those European countries that, that were the original members of these international agreements, um, no one was extending patent protection to what, were, what we would think of today as life-saving products. And so even for developed countries, uh, the extension of patent protection to pharmaceuticals is, is something that is very recent. And there, there has always been great contest about, is this the way to uh, do public policy on, on, a, on, a, on a product that has such a significant impact um, on human development and human well-being. So that's always been a question on the table, and I think that's important to note. Last point, again, for journalists who are writing about this, is that there are, um, so Indian, the, the Indian generics industry was able to develop precisely because India decided it would not extend patents to pharmaceuticals, which allowed Indian generic firms to essentially copycat um, um, uh, medicines that came into the Indian market. And so the pharmaceutical industries of the global south were an explicit target of the TRIPS agreement. I mean, this was part of what brought us TRIPS was the effort to begin to insist on patent protection for pharmaceuticals in countries like Brazil and South Africa and India. Uh, well, South Africa more recently, but India in particular. Um, and so I think that's an important component that there is a, a geopolitical uh, competitive um, uh, dimension of this debate. And the real issue is whether in the context of global public health, um, the best way to do innovation is through a system that is exclusive and proprietary um, in the way that it is. Um, Jennifer mentioned something about the role of the government, and I think with COVID-19 in particular, scholars and, and lots of policymakers, I think, have been talking about this problem for a very long time. Certainly in the U.S., Operation Warp Speed, there was significant public investment in um, the, the, the development of the COVID-19 vaccines. Um, NIH's investment, I think, is unprecedented. 
And part of what policymakers are thinking about and, and scholars are thinking about scholars of innovation and intellectual property scholars like myself, what does it mean to have the government invest as much taxpayer funds into the development of a vaccine and then to have that vaccine priced out of reach of more than half of the world's population? It's an ethical question, but it's also a structural question about um, Yes, um, I think it's important. The scientists that are working in, in Pfizer and Merck and Moderna and Johnson and Johnson, um, at the end of the day, these are businesses and we want to reward innovation. That's the, that's the premise of the patent system. Um, the question is how much reward and what do we do about the other contributions by other actors? that are part of this innovation ecosystem to which Jennifer refers. And I think um, the HIV pandemic was, was a wake up moment. Um, I, I sat on the UN high level panel on access to medicines and almost every country in the world is dealing with the high cost of drugs and what it's doing to pension funds. This is a, a global crisis and COVID-19 I think sort of blew the top off. Um, and there are all of these considerations that as journalists are writing about this, um, I, I hope are helpful in, in shaping the context in which we're evaluating the policy choices the governments are making. Okay, well, let me, let me stop there and turn it over to you, Andrea, for the kind of ethical and political side. You've been covering this issue in Washington, covering the Biden administration's response and talking to President Biden about what he, how he felt about this. So first of all, What's been the Biden administration's position? Has it changed? And where do you see this story going now after Geneva? Yeah, well, you know, it's been very interesting to see the evolution. And, um, and I really commend the National Press Foundation and, and you for pulling this panel together because it's, it's kind of niche you know what I mean? It, 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 in Washington, we have big topics that everyone talks about. And this WTO IP waiver issue was pretty niche So, um, uh, you know, it, it, it didn't get as much attention and it was difficult. And I sometimes felt, um, you know, there, would, there was a kind of a, a group of us in the White House press corps who would ask these questions and, and, and try to get at this discussion that was going on. And, and, you know, a lot of the other journalists were really not picking up on it. So I think it's important that we do pay attention to these things as it turns out then it, you know, when the president um, weighed in it, it it elevated the discussion in a way uh, that you know hadn't happened before then. So um, you know I think it's important for us to pay attention to these things. And I the way um, you know so many things are not resolved now. This is the problem, right? So there's been uh, you know a year and a half. To almost two years of, of discussion about this issue. And we have a solution that as you know, as everyone's talked about, doesn't make anyone happy. And so the fighting will continue in six months, we're going to do it all again. Well, because you know, now there, you know, we have to have a discussion about treatments and diagnostics, which are not included in this, um, you know, kind of limited agreement that was reached by the WTO. And what oh, hold on, let me just stop you there for one second. Sure. Let me just stop you there. So does that mean that COVID tests can be patented and um, they, they, there's no waiver for a COVID test anywhere in the world? You cannot copy that technology, right? If you're India, for example? Yeah, it's under, I mean, it's not part of this uh, agreement now, as, as I understand it. Okay, and also antivirals. If you're South Africa, you can't do what um, Dr. Okadji just said, which is just slightly change the molecule and then patent it and do your own antiviral. You have to play by yeah. these rules. No, and I mean, and actually to Professor Okadji's point, the, this, the, the fact that this isn't included perpetuates this grave imbalance, right? So that the rich countries that can afford to build these things and research them and patent them and have a you know a lock on these things um, will be able to you, you could see a situation where mortality rates are just significantly higher in countries where therapeutics are not widely available. I mean, this is bigger obviously than just COVID. We've you know we've focused a lot of the attention on COVID, but this is also true in in many other aspects of medicine as well. So it. Having, you know, having that lock 
on these things when there is a medical crisis, I, you know, leads to these outcomes that are, uh, you know, that raise moral questions, right? So from the beginning of this epidemic, and first an epidemic and then a pandemic, um, international organizations, you know, whether it was the head of the World Bank or the head of the IMF or, you know, various UN officials and certainly um, the World Trade Organization started to raise this issue as a, as a fundamental moral and, and ethical question. And those are difficult topics for us as journalists to get into, right? You know, it's easy to do a sort of tick-tock of he, shed, he said, she said, you know, industry says this and NGOs say this, but it's much more difficult to, to uh, embrace and get your arms around the, gl the global implications of a story like that. And frankly, you know, there is my critique of our profession is that we, are being driven ever more to shorter and shorter and shorter stories. And that means that you can't get into the nuance. Everything gets boiled down to, you know, three, four, 500 words, maybe if you're lucky, 700 words. Um, and, and that does no one, of, you know, it's a disservice in a way, right? It, dry, it means that the mainstream discourse at, you know, driven by wire services like Reuters or, or the New York Times, we, you know, we're, we're writing shorter and shorter stories so that the details that really bring this story to life are relegated to trade publications and th that are not widely consumed and therefore aren't, you know, in the consciousness of, of policymakers either. I'll stop. Sorry. No, before we go on, I want to talk about the, the niche what you said is this is sort of a niche issue. Um, and uh, frankly, we're doing this panel at the National Press Foundation because we don't think it's a niche issue. So let me throw to all three of you the broader issue, you know, which Professor, you talked about and, and Jen, you also touched on it. But all right, so now we have, um, we have a question here in the chat about variants and what happens to COVID specific variants. But we're at a point where we know this is not the first um, pandemic, there's gonna be another one. We have monkeypox or whatever, we're going to rename monkeypox that will be more uh, appropriate name. Um, and also the Washington Post, what, two weeks ago had a front page story about you know the advent of cancer vaccines which are, are again going to create huge global demand um, and are going to be you know the the idea of cancer inequity of only rich countries getting cancer vaccines we can imagine what the you know the um, uh, reportage is going to be on that globally and then but back to the same issue that that, that Jen raised which is yeah people will maybe pharmaceutical companies will help they'll share some stuff, but if they have to give up their crown jewels, they are not going to do, they're not going to share and, and innovation will be much slower. And you're not going to see the kind of progress or the kind of global, amazing global cooperation that you saw, you know, during the pandemic. So can we just fast forward this away from COVID and um, has anything changed during the COVID vaccine or with this WTO discussion uh, that's going to affect what happens with monkeypox and variant vaccines and cancer? Um, so basically, from where I sit, um, capacity building for manufacturing is a really important topic right now. And this is something I think uh, certainly the TRIPS waiver is meant to stimulate and, and accelerate. And I do, do, I do work with some of the upstream companies in the pharmaceuticals and biologics value chains who are providing inputs, equipment, services, um, training for human capital, those kinds of things that, that do enable manufacturers, especially in emerging countries like South Africa, um, to move up the value chain. This process is called backwards integration, right? You start with packaging vaccines. Let's take vaccines as an example. First you package them, then you move up to do what we call fill and finish. Then you might start producing bulk antigen, uh, the active ingredient for the vaccine and so on. And what you observe is over the arc of time, this process is done usually in close collaboration with a technology partner. You learn by doing, working side by side. And it's through that process, I was mentioning trade secrets before, um, a lot of trade secrets, a lot of know-how, um, you know, things like things that you wouldn't necessarily be able to put on paper or write in a manual. You have to learn by doing. That's transmitted to the other party um, and you enhance capacity over time in that way. Um, a very big, a key issue here is human capital and training. And on that, I have to say that the WHO is doing something really great in South Korea. They're starting a new hub for training people on biomanufacturing. Mm 
I think there's a great story there, um, bringing people from different countries to teach them the processes, you know, how to establish quality controls, um, work the equipment, et cetera. And I think that's a great effort. Um, and so, so I think this question of capacity building and how do we extend manufacturing capacity and also R&D capacity, you know, so countries can look at their own regional and national health problems that may not rise to the attention of the global innovators. Um, that's a very crucial question that's on the agenda here in Switzerland. We have a question coming in from Ramu. Uh, now WHO is sharing the knowledge and asks for the technology transfer for vaccine production to lower income countries like Nepal. Is it a copyright issue? Is it an ethical question or not? Well, it's not a copyright issue, or it could be. Um, and and so the the kind of knowledge that Jennifer is talking about, um, I, I think it's important for the journalists writing about this to distinguish between know-how, which is not technically thought of as intellectual property, but could easily come within its ambit. So know-how is the sort of working by side by side, you know, um, to know how to do something. That's not always a trade secret. In other words, it could be something that everyone knows, but until you actually practice it, um, um, you, you are not able to do it. So know-how is um, a facet of, of this production process and this capacity building in order to expand manufacturing um, capabilities um, around the world. Um, my colleague here at the Harvard Law School, Terry Fisher, has, um, in a re recent paper, we talked about apprenticeship programs, which is really how things were done um, uh, years ago, and, and, and frankly, in the medical field still today. This is why you know medical doctors go to residencies and have fellowships. You're learning how to be a surgeon, how to be the, the specialist in your field. Trade, trade secrets are defined at the state level, although there are federal um, regimes for trade secret protection, but trade secrets are um, essentially information that has economic value because it is a secret. Uh, in, in other words, if you were to share that information, your capacity to monetize it disappears. And it, unlike patents and copyrights, um, it is protected um, at the national, at, at the state level in most countries, um, um, although there are countries that, that have a federal trade secret regime, including the United States, for limited um, uh, purposes. Copyright protects literary and artistic works. So, uh, Ramu, to your question, if this knowledge is written in a manual or in a book or in a slide deck. The slide deck, the manual, and the book will be protected by copyright. No one can copy it. No one can um, uh, make a derivative work out of it. No one can translate it without the permission of the copyright owner. So one of the challenges that um, I think that needs to be um, at least clear, I think, um, Andrea and Jennifer both hinted at it, but I want to make it explicit, is that when we talk about access to medicines and access to vaccines, we are talking about multiple and overlapping forms of intellectual property. So the idea is protected by the patent. The packaging could be protected by a trademark or a trade dress. The actual manufacturing could be um, um, protected by a trade secret. Um, and you could have books discussing how to do it or manuals telling you how to fill and pack. That would be protected by copyright. So even if you got a waiver on a patent, you still may have a copyright problem. Or if you got a waiver on a copyright, you may have a trade secret problem. Or if you got a waiver on the trade secret and you could make the generics easily, you would not be able to sell them under the brand name or under the trade dress the way it's packaged. And that's a component of this problem that I think the journalists should be really cognizant of, that you could, you could get a waiver on the technology and yet still have barriers because other forms of intellectual property are in fact um, uh, still enclosing the dimensions of the knowledge. And then on top of all that, we have contracts where generics or licensees or would-be uh, manufacturers sign contracts saying, we promise not to make this on our own, even if we learned how to. And those are private arrangements that have nothing to do with intellectual property, but could impede the dissemination of uh, vaccines and other medicines. So it's what I refer to as an intellectual property thicket. Um, that could be also then uh, cemented in, in a private contract 
um, that a waiver can't penetrate. So we really, uh, when we're talking about this, it is an ethical problem um, when you look at the outcome, but it is also a legal problem and a policy problem of whether or not we are going to create um, an environment in which access to life-saving medicines has so many barriers to it that we're saving less lives than we possibly can. I think that's the that's the real question um, uh, about how we we uh, evaluate um, the legal landscape of these issues. So the WHO has this knowledge, um, and and if it's in manuals and teaching materials, yes, it will be subject to a copyright, um, and yes, it will mean that the copyright owner can give permission to photocopy and or we don't photocopy anymore. You know, scan, do whatever it is we do. Um, but a copyright owner could also say, um, absolutely not. Um, same thing with a trademark owner or a trade dress owner, same thing with a patent owner. So let's go back to the variant, since variant and monkeypox are the two, you know, urgent issues coming out here. Um, are you satisfied that this not very satisfactory to anybody deal in <laughs> at the WGO last week is enough to enable companies to move? fast to bring solutions on variants on monkeypox to market in you know in time to save lives is it going to work or is it inadequate or is it irrelevant um you know i, I think so my view is that the waiver is important as a normative matter that what it's saying is that governments acknowledge that we have a crisis that lives are being lost, um, that there's suffering happening, and to the extent that there are intellectual property fixes that can be had, we need to pursue them. During the HIV AIDS pandemic, Gilead actually is a wonderful example of a, of a firm that kind of said, we, we can't be quiet. We've got remdesivir, we've got these AIDS drugs, and we've got to get them to these populations that are dying. And Gilead really pioneered um, a voluntary licensing scheme in which they partnered with local manufacturers um, and began to have access to these markets. Um, what we're seeing, Andrea, in my view, is that there's a business model being disrupted. Um, prior to HIV, even though we had an access to medicines problem, we, we didn't have the internet, we didn't have the ease of communication that made everyone aware that a, there's an Ebola breakout, maybe you want to close the borders, or there's another breakout here. Now that we get our knowledge instantaneously, governments are all of a sudden realizing there's a cost to every pandemic, um, every global health, uh, uh, health crisis. So that's something the governments keep in mind. And so now we have to have a solution. We've got to fix this problem, we've got to create pressure on all parties to come together and collaborate. Um, and I think the waiver discussion has done that. It's made it clear that there is the political will um, if the crisis is significant enough and affects rich and poor countries, um, it, it, there's a crisis that governments are willing to exercise their policy prerogatives to bring the technology to a place where people have access. And so for the first time, I, I'm, I'm a, a patent um, scholar and, and you look historically at the, at the use of compulsory licenses to um, okay. essentially force um, um, uh, you know, patent owners to, to make um, uh, the products available or uh, generics firms will be allowed to essentially replicate the technology. But countries that had never utilized their national laws to um, say we're going to issue a compulsory license began talking about it. Canada, Israel, United States, um, countries began to raise export restrictions until I mean, what people are referring to as vaccine nationalism. So we're seeing now that all of a sudden what South Africa was saying during the AIDS pandemic, what, what uh, Malaysia and Indonesia with their communicable disease problems and, and, and Africa with all of the health challenges, all of a sudden rich countries began to talk about this. We, we have to save the lives of our people. And so I think the waiver in many ways forget the practicalities, the waiver says, okay, we at least have to acknowledge that there is a problem and that IP has a, is a part of that problem. Now, what, I'm, what I think will happen is that pharmaceuticals who are really thinking about global public health, not just as a business 
but as a part of service to humanity, are going to be thinking of opportunities to create new business models that rewards the innovation without creating barriers to access. Voluntary licensing that Gilead pioneered is an example of that, where local manufacturers and local producers partnered with Gilead, they released their technology, um, those local producers began to manufacture the drugs, um, and there were long-term partnerships fostered, not just for HIV drugs, but even beyond. And I think this is a wonderful opportunity, and here at Harvard we are looking at voluntary licensing um, and access to medicines as a pathway um, that doesn't involve a waiver and doesn't involve a compulsory license and fosters the possibilities for returns on investment um, for innovation. I think what we're gonna see emerge is a toolkit. With the waiver at the background, there will be a toolkit in which companies are starting to think, how do we contribute meaningfully and sustainably while also safeguarding our innovation? All of this, by the way, um, in the face of artificial intelligence and the role that that's going to play in allowing the middle income countries to become competitive in a way that they were not able to be because of infrastructure and capacity deficits. I think we're gonna to start to see a lot of shifts and disruptions in the old model that relied on monopoly profits, on exclusive technological know-how. And we're gonna see that shifting now to countries um, as we see new technologies burst onto the scene. There was also, I mean, the you know the USTR, uh, U.S. Trade Representative Catherine Tai, um, also talked a lot about using the power of persuasion. You know, you talked about the massive government investment that went into these, uh, you know, development of these vaccines, and so I think um, you know Ambassador Tai, you know, reminded a couple of companies about the massive U.S. investment and really strongly encouraged them to look at these voluntary licensing agreements. I think you'll see more of that. I also wanted to make just one other point, which is that the pandemic raised questions in general about resilience. And, you know, in terms of like this kind of runaway globalization, right? Where everything is outsourced and nothing is made in, in the advanced economies and everything is brought in. Obviously the, the, the things have shifted dramatically. We started to see a little bit of that during the height of the US-China trade war. But I think one of the things that's happened is that each country now is thinking like, what is the base? What do we need? What capacity do we need? To your point, Jen, about capacity building. And this goes broader, much broader than just pharmaceuticals. It's also about food production. And so, you know, we're seeing now as a result of the war in Ukraine, these dependencies that, that are too extreme, that leave countries vulnerable when unexpected things happen. And, you know, I think we're in a, in a kind of an inflection point where the, the, the way that we think about production of whether it's vaccines or medicines or food or, or you know energy, a, a lot of that is being rethought now. And I think we're, we'll see when this all shakes out, um, hopefully um, a, a, a better and more equitable distribution of, of those capacities. But you know, the, to the point is like, that is all, those are huge business opportunities. Right, so it's like, you know, there isn't necessarily, it's the, the, the business, the money isn't just to be made on that, you know, prop, you know the, the patent on one particular drug. There's all those different layers where companies can be making money and engaging in, um, in, in, in profitable activities. I wanted to pick up quickly on the, the voluntary licensing point that, um, that both of you actually just made. Um, just going back to the research and kind of this deep dive into the first 18 months of the pandemic and how innovation happened. I mean, one thing we did observe, which I referenced before, was an explosion in global partnerships for manufacturing. And how does that work? You go and you train, you share knowledge, you share know-how, you share, you know, you license your patents or you help the contract manufacturer to learn how to make what you want them to make safely um, and efficiently. And that's all based on an approach of voluntary licensing, right? And that resulted in a lot of entities from emerging countries, Brazil, Indonesia, et cetera, 
South Africa being brought into these value chains um, and in doing so, enhancing the capacity in that place. Um, I think also we have to look at the practicality of things like the TRIPS waiver and look at the lessons learned during the pandemic. You know, look at what's happening with vaccines and look a little closely and carefully at why aren't they getting to people? Like, why do we have this unacceptable vaccine inequity? You know, are, are our distribution systems adequate? Is it an IP issue? If so, what are exactly the points where IP is not being shared through voluntary licensing or other arrangements? Um, and just make sure that we're really looking and, uh, and analyzing the problem and then targeting it appropriately. And we'll see what ends up happening with the TRIPS waiver, who ends up using it under what circumstances, et cetera. And I think there we'll have our answer. You know, Is this the right approach? Is this gonna deliver a practical impact to get people vaccines and other you know, therapeutics, diagnostics, what's needed for, for this and future health crises? We have a question uh, coming in from Mansai Vaidaya at um, Pharmaceutical Technology publication. How does the WTO agreement for vaccines compare to individual licensing agreements pursued by companies like Pfizer with uh, Medicines Patent Pool for antiviral access? Jen, you want to tackle that one? Yes. Um, so the WTO agreement is an agreement that allows countries to set aside the patent protection for a vaccine or certain ingredients used for its manufacture. Whereas the licenses that are negotiated with um, innovators like Pfizer from the medicines patent pool um, provide a basis for then licensing through those technologies to other companies um, so they can use and make them. So there, there are different mechanisms um, for, for making technology available to manufacturers or others who wish to use them. Andrea, let me turn this back to you for a news question. So we've heard a whole bunch of interesting story ideas go by, including WHO training in South Korea to, for capacity building, the uh, future equity issues that were raised, this question of innovation, and are we hitting the right, are we actually targeting the right part of the inequity problem that you're raising? What are some of the other, where is this this bouncing ball, where is it going? Where is, how does the Biden administration view this WTO agreement? And where do you think this story is going next? I think the Biden administration is pleased that they were able to get this across the finish line. And, you know, <laughs> however unsatisfactory it, it might be, um, it, it was something. And I think uh, it was about more than just the, um, the, the issue at hand. It was also a test, a litmus test for the future of the World Trade Organization as a whole. I mean, if international organizations cannot rise to the occasion when there is truly such a cataclysmic event that has taken so many lives across the world, you know, there is a question of like, what purpose do these organizations fill? And I think that was a, um, an important point that the Director General of the uh, World Trade Organization, Negozia Kanjai Uyala, made in her private negotiations with countries, where you know it, it was like we have to show that this organization is fit for purpose, at least some purpose. So I think the Biden administration is pleased, but realizes there's a lot more to do. So one of the follow-on questions is obviously in six months, they're gonna go back and look at the diagnostics and treatments in this specific area. Um, but then moreover, there are fundamental reform questions about who holds power? How does the World Trade Organization make decisions? It's a consensus-based organization. So everyone has to agree. And we came this close to having zero agreements because India in particular was very obstructionist by all accounts, uh, you know, from all sides, there was a lot of frustration because India had a single issue that they really wanted to get addressed. And, um, you know, so, is the, is the structure of the organization okay? That will be another fight that happens. Um, and I, I just wanna put in a little plug, you know, um, if for those in the audience who are interested, really interested in these issues, we actually have a job open in Geneva. So apply for the job and you can spend your days and nights <laughs> uh, writing these stories. <laughs> I'll come to law school. I think it's useful. You know, like if you're a journalist, you want to know about jobs, right? So. 
Ah, oh, we're a nonprofit with many purposes, everybody. <laughs> Let, can I go back to the relevance question um, Ruth, you raised? The, you know, is WTO now relevant? Did by by pulling together this agreement, are they now in the relevant category? Or in your view, is this just, you know, like a little trivial thing that doesn't really matter? It's, is it a milestone or not? I think it matters. Um, um, I think it absolutely matters. To Andrea's point, um, people are unhappy because it matters. And, and I think if we, you know, if we were looking for, for the currency of, of the institution, people's unhappiness speaks to that. Um, but the test, you know, is, is still ahead. Um, this is um, a midterm. It's not a final. It, it, it doesn't tell us whether we will, in fact, be able to get meaningful breakthrough. Um, I, I think Jennifer and I agree, and I think even Andrea has made this point, there is no silver bullet to this problem. And what I hope journalists writing about this will keep in mind is we, what we know is we have a profound inequity. It's, and, and we can quibble about the waiver all day long, but people are dying. And they are dying because they don't have medicines that exist and that richer countries have access to more easily. And we have that inequity problem even within our own borders. So I think it's really important to keep the moral pressure on policymakers and on these institutions. Um, the relevance of the multilateral system is going to be significant because the rules for the world are made there or not made. And when they're not made, people die. And if they're made incompletely, inadequately, um, you know, um, people, people die. And so what are we going to provide for the next generation? What are we going to be prepared for, for the next global health crisis? And, and so I think that it was really important for um, Ngozi to get this. Um, uh, and, and to Andrea's point, she had to pull that lever of if we can't address a problem that shut the world down and cost so many lives, if we can't do that at the multilateral level, why do we have these institutions? And I think that was an important lever for her to use because that is really the question of the day. So um, people are, unha are unhappy enough that the work will go on. There will be work at Medicine's Patent Pool, which of course um, was an outgrowth of the AIDS HIV uh, pandemic situation. There will be work at the WHO level. Remember that Ebola is still there. There is still a problem. The US has a stockpile of um, medicines for Ebola, but, but you know, Africa where, where this can, can easily ravage millions in, in, in less than a day, um, doesn't have access to it. Um, there are diseases that are coming up that we know nothing about, to your point about uh, monkeypox. So this will keep the conversation going and this um, accomplishment, because I think we have to acknowledge that it is something that was done to signal the importance of the work that is yet to be done. And journalists, I think, keep the moral pressure on. I wanted to come in on that point. I think we need to be a little bit tough on the WTO at the same time. And we need to um, to insist that there, the metric for success not just be agreement, but the agreement of something that would deliver a positive, tangible impact, which is, I think, what we're all looking for here, um, something that will really change lives. And being in Geneva and talking with the delegates who were you know, up all night negotiating this waiver um, last week, there was some frustration over the last year because they would say, you know, where give me give us the specific examples of where IP is the problem. Give us the example. Give us the example. And they felt like they weren't getting adequate detail and information back from the proponents of the waiver along the way. Um, it was something I heard pretty regularly, and I think that apart from the trips discussions, there was another very important work program that had a lot of potential, which was a trade and health work program also, that steadily shrank. And that was a, a lost opportunity, I think, to look at you know, export restrictions, tariffs, some other things that can also cause you know, problems for, for development and delivery of, of medicines and other things that we need. 
So I think that was a missed opportunity. Um, it's a story that wasn't covered. Um, and another story I think um, in health and trade in addition to the, the manufacturing training hub in South Korea could be if not the WTO, what? Right, like people were signaling, oh, this could be the death of the WTO. Okay, but then what? Um, let's look at, you know, what alternatives there exist? What are the pros and cons of those? I didn't see very many articles um, exploring that, and that might be an idea as well. Mm -hmm. The other thing is uh, the World uh, Bank is in the process of setting up at the behest of the G20, something called a financial intermediary fund for pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response. That's a mouthful, but basically it's to start putting money away for the next pandemic. And they, they I, I think it's gonna be finalized. They sort of got some, some initial points already going to be taking it to the board. It's got a billion dollars pledged into it already, which is nothing, not enough. But but that, you know, those are there are many, many stories to pursue now. As you know, we've gone through the crisis, the, the, the worst of it, the, of the pandemic, I guess. Now people are trying to catch their breath and think about like, wow, how do we get ahead of the next one? And, you know, um, yeah. but I, I also wanted to say something about, um, about Ruth's point about these inter multilateral organizations. So the, the questions are being raised, not just about the World Trade Organization, but about the IMF and about the World Bank and about the entire, so sort of these Bretton Woods institutions that were created so many years ago because our global economy has changed significantly. And the structure, the organizational structure, who runs those, who has power in those organizations has not shifted at all to keep up and you know I, I think you know a lot of the subtext in these discussions is what role does China play going forward because it is such a large economy it didn't exist in that dimension at all when these institutions were created and so we're you know and then on top of it now Russia um, and is is being expelled from this community you know, from the global community, the global commons, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot that's going to be happening in coming years, months. Okay, and well, sanctions. thank you. Oh, I was going to say one oh, thing, sanctions sure. too, you know, in <laughs> relation to Russia, um, with regional manufacturing of medicines, unless the sanctions are allowing for those inputs, equipment, final products to get through, that can create a lot of human suffering. And that's something actually I've not seen also written up. Story well, the sanctions, are, sanctions are exempted for humanitarian, re I mean, um, medicine is exempted for medicines, vaccines, all those things are exempted. I imagine- and Not the upstream products. So right. the upstream sure. products for making them regionally that might be considered dual use, that kind of thing are not. So where you're dependent on that regional manufacturing to serve that local population, those products aren't getting through. They don't fall in the definition, so. It's another angle. Mm. We should talk. <laughs> okay, another story idea. So this program is being recorded. It will be on our website and also on NPF's YouTube channel. Um, sincere thanks to all of you for helping unpack this complex issue. I'm Dr. Okeji from Harvard, Jennifer Brandt from the Innovation Institute, and Andrea Shalal from Reuters. Thank you. And um, good stories out there. Look forward to reading you all.